Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos on the philosophy of accelerationism by today considering how Jacques Derrida's view of différence, as presented in his essay of the same name within the book Margins of Philosophy, compares to Deleuze's view of difference and, by extension, that of Nick Lan. In addition, we will consider some interesting things about language, and especially written language, that we know from the earliest written language, which is ancient Sumerian. This is a part of the School of Forbidden Texts. Remember, you can join us there too for the extremely low price of just $2 per month, links to both my Patreon and subscribe to our account in the video description. Now, as you may recall from my video on Deleuze last year, pure difference, or as Deleuze calls it, difference in itself, is, of course, one of the two main themes of Deleuze's great metaphysical treatise, Difference and Repetition, the other one being Repetition. So it would make sense now to consider how Derrida's view of the same theme compares to that of Deleuze. But contrary to expectation, um, this famous talk by Derrida um, actually is not about difference, if by that you mean the word which is spelled with two e's. Instead, this is a talk about différence, which is a new term coined by Derrida himself, which ironically sounds exactly the same as the standard word difference, despite being spelled differently. Now, admittedly, this is a play on words which only really makes sense in Derrida's native language of French, because due to the rules of French pronunciation, the second E in the French word différence would be pronounced the same way as an A in the new word Derrida coined, which is différence. So without a written text, it would be impossible to tell which of those two words was being used. And this is meant to call into question the old Saussurean idea that speech is always prior to writing, because in Saussure's view, writing is nothing except a secondary and belated representation of a speech which, in comparison, would seem to be fully present, fully living, etc. So by coining a new term that actually reveals or discloses more in its written form than its spoken form ever could, Derrida seeks to intentionally disrupt this hierarchical distinction between the supposed full presence of speech on one hand and the lack of presence in writing on the other. But he does not do this in order to claim that writing has the full presence which speech has been proven to lack. Instead, Derrida does this in order to reveal that nothing, in fact, is characterized by full presence, because this invasion of speech by writing reveals everything, in fact, to be a form of writing in disguise. This means that everything escapes the metaphysics of presence, because writing has the strange status of being neither present nor absent, if you really think about it. Writing is not fully present, as speech would seem to be, because writing can represent a meaning which is not there, a meaning beyond itself. That's the point of writing something down so that later on it will still be accessible, even after the person who wrote it or the things being described are no longer there. And yet, on the other hand, writing also is not fully absent, because the inscription continues to reveal and to, in fact, reveal more than living speech could, as we see through Derrida's own pun of différence. So to see how Derrida arrives at this surprising conclusion, we will walk through this admittedly dense and convoluted talk in this video and go through the text as a whole. As mentioned earlier, Derrida presented this talk about a new term, différence, um, in which he substitutes an A for the second E in the original spelling of the word, in order to show that even after making this modification to the written text, the sound of the word as spoken within speech would remain exactly the same, even as a different word had been written down. An additional irony built into this particular play on words is, of course, the fact that the different word that differs from the first word in its written form alone is itself none other than the very word for difference itself. Humorously, then, we can say that difference, 
differs from the other word for difference because a minimal difference has been introduced into what would otherwise seem to the naked ear to be exactly the same or the self-identical word. And that this has been done to a word which is itself just the linguistic symbol of the very notion of a negation of any coherent and self-identical notion. After all, this is the symbol of difference, which is the exact opposite of identity. We must be very careful, however, with interpreting Derrida's language games as displayed within this text in particular, for Derrida's whole argument here is to caution us against thinking that this could prove that difference could take on the role of being, say, a more general concept, which would be inclusive of both of these different words in any archaic metaphysical sense. In other words, Derrida's point here is not to suggest that difference could be anything like a universal category, or a first principle, or an ultimate genus which includes all of being. Instead, Derrida's reason for singling out difference among all the words in the French, or for that matter within the English language, is that this allows us to notice a certain disruption of the very idea of a universal concept. In other words, we no longer can seek out something which could cleanly subsume all of its instances under a more general heading, because that's exactly what is not going on with regard to différence. Rather, this shows us a kind of disruption which is not unique to just this word. For Derrida's point here is that any system has always already been disrupted by the same minimal difference which is unearthed within this talk. As Derrida opens the talk itself, he admits that, in a certain sense, this talk is not even about a whole word, but is instead about the disruption which is caused by just one letter. Now, it's not a coincidence that that letter, which does the disrupting, is also the first letter of the alphabet. This is the letter A. But that should not mislead you to think that it is anything like an axiom of language in the sense of, say, Euclidean geometry. You may recall that Euclid's elements had provided a system for one to build up a huge number of other proofs from a small handful of, let's call them, free truths, which are given at the very beginning of the text. These are axioms because they are self-evident, and the ancient Greek view was that if you didn't have axioms, which you don't have to prove because they're already self-evident, you would have one of two problems. Either you would have an infinite regress, or you would have circular reasoning. For this reason, you're able to have a system like Euclid's elements only because those are given first. Well, rather than treat the letter A as a new axiom of language, which has that rule because it's coming first within the alphabet, Derrida's whole point here is to instead call into question the very idea that such an axiomatic foundation ever could stabilize language or any other system for that matter. Rather than use the letter A to establish the rules of a system, Derrida does the exact opposite. He inserts the letter into the word as a blatant suspension of the rules of the language, which would dictate that you'd have to spell it with an E. For this, he makes no apology, by the way, but instead chooses to intensify the playful attitude which lies behind this violation of the rule, if, indeed, the latter really is a rule. But what is difference after all? The word which has not so coincidentally been chosen to reveal a minimal difference inserted between a word and its own self. Well, Derrida warns us that difference is not a concept, if by that you mean the Kantian universal under which so many particular instances can be subsumed. You might remember that in classical logic, the intention and extension of any given concept are inversely related to one another because the more general a concept is, the more things will fall under it while well, the narrower a concept is in its meaning, the fewer things will be covered by it. It is in this specific sense, I think, that Derrida warns us against thinking of difference as a concept, 
because it paradoxically tells us something about how everything is without, however, being anything like the most general concept under which all things would fall because they share the same meaning in a Kantian sense. Difference is instead a complete alternative to, and in fact a disruption of, that idea. Difference not only disrupts the universality of concept, it also disrupts the model of phenomenological givenness, because the difference between difference, spelled with an E, and différence, spelled with an A, is something which not only cannot be apprehended in hearing speech, as we've already clarified, it is something which cannot be apprehended at all. Because the purely graphic nature of this difference is located within writing, the Cartesian model of conscious perception is fundamentally demoted and devalued because it really is not up to the task of capturing this difference between the two differences within the space of phenomenological consciousness. Because différence reveals speech to not be the living speech once dreamed of, or the speech which is living because what it is really fully present to is just the speaker himself or herself. This is the idea of a full presence of self-consciousness to itself. Well, this really is not what you have within différence, because of the additional irony that the letter which disrupts this is the letter A itself, which in its capitalized form looks just like a pyramid. And you might recall near the very end of the Phenomenology of Spirit in the Religion chapter, Hegel pointed out the irony that the Egyptian pyramid is itself the symbol of death. This is a a supreme failure to unite God and nature in one religious symbol, which is the goal of that chapter, because despite the massive size of the pyramid, for all of its archaeological or architectural impressiveness, it literally was just a storehouse for the dead pharaoh. So too, Derrida tells us now, the letter A is the symbol of the figurative death of the full presence of the living speaker because of its revelation of the priority of writing over any kind of speech. Anyone who is skeptical of this claim must bear in mind, as Derrida notes himself, that even if one were to try to rely on speech to orally clarify whether difference had been written with an A or an E, the written text would still have to be passed through in order to clarify that. In other words, even the oral recitation can only happen if it refers to the written manuscript in some way. This itself, however, only provides one particular example of what always happens within language, for the deeper truth is that speech always has to pass through writing in order to work, in contrast with the typical linguistic model that would order things the other way around. Derrida uses this discovery to dare to claim that there actually is, then, no such thing as phonetic writing, because writing does not merely attempt to represent what is heard within speech, because writing also contains a lot of things that simply cannot be heard because even our phonetic writing system in the West is still contaminated by many non-phonetic elements like spacing and punctuation. Although this is not mentioned by Derrida himself, it is worth noting that the world's oldest writing system also contained a lot of symbols that were not meant to be pronounced out loud, but still disclosed a lot of meaning. As I have been learning the ancient Sumerian language lately, I was very interested to find that in the original cuneiform writing, phonetic characters were only one of three kinds of symbols, and more like an accidental use of them. In Sumerian, it might be known that there were ideograms which represent a whole idea because the symbol often kind of looks like the thing which it's supposed to represent. The symbol for a cow's head, for example, kind of looks like a cow's head. Well, my favorite example is that the symbol for Dingyar, or God, 
looks like a star, perhaps because of some astrological relation to the divine which the Sumerians understood within their own religion. Well, in addition to the star symbol as representing the word for God, it could also be used as a determinative or a sign that tells you about what kind of word follows after it. If you wrote the name of a specific god such as Enlil or more literally Lord Wind, you would not just write the proper name as would be the case within our language. Instead, in ancient Sumerian cuneiform, you would place the symbol for a god or the star symbol before the name of a particular god in order to give a clue to the reader about what kind of semantic category the following word belonged to. You know that this was the name of a god because you saw Dinger written before it without having to pronounce that word if you were reading the manuscript out loud. There were also determinative symbols for things like place names such as the symbol key, which is usually the word for earth, but would be placed before the name of, say, a city. Once again, these determinative symbols were not meant to be pronounced, but still disclosed a lot of meaning. Finally, some symbols could be used phonologically. This was largely done through combining symbols together that had already been ideograms, in much the same way that in English, if I were to draw a picture of a bumblebee next to a symbol of a falling leaf, you would be able to spell out the word belief from juxtaposing those two images and combining the maybe accidental phonological meaning of what were originally more like ideograms standing for an entire concept because they had something like a pictorial similarity to the thing they represented. Well, one might argue that in the oldest writing system, phonetic spelling was something which could be done, but it was maybe more like an afterthought or an accidental use of a writing system which was not inherently phonetic. Well, thousands of years later, Derrida seems to have only confirmed this and to have done so within a language like literary French or literary English, which would seem by, by its very nature to restrict writing to only one use, but still somehow found itself disrupted by the same paradox. But even if we are working with a writing system that is supposed to be purely phonetic, in that we no longer use determinative signs or ideograms in the same way that Sumerian cuneiform had done, we still find that even the modern Sosorian model of linguistics is disrupted by difference and by its own rules. You may recall that in Sosorian structuralist linguistics, we don't ever positively know what any given symbol means in and of itself. We only know negatively that one symbol is not another. We know that one symbol is different from another symbol within the same language. And according to Saussure, it is this difference between two symbols that generates meaning as a retroactive side effect. Derrida notes, though, that because Saussure was a structuralist, this play of the signs is itself something which is always happening silently and imperceptibly. It does not take place within our speech, because for so sure the system of long always precedes the performance of parole. For so sure, of course, parole is the speech that actually comes out of your mouth or any use of language within, say, writing an essay, but long is the purely abstract system of symbolic differences which had to have already been presupposed in order for you to use it. This is why dead languages like Latin or Gothic or Sumerian for that matter can still make sense as languages despite the fact that nobody really speaks them anymore. So for Derrida, this means that the Saussurian play of the signs actually is in itself a form of writing in disguise.
because it gives us a difference which is inherently inaudible. You can't hear it. So if speech does seem to convey meaning through particular subject's use of parole, it's only because the silent play of differences had already differentiated one signifier from another and had done so outside of or beyond the entire phenomenological model of a subject and its perceptions. For this reason, difference cannot be thought of as a mere object of human understanding, because difference cannot make itself adequate to any of the requirements of the human subject's standards of intelligibility. For this reason, you might recall that Zizek interpreted Derrida's difference as something shockingly similar to Kant's transcendental conditions of experience. Zizek has repeatedly noted that Derrida's understanding of difference is something which makes presentation possible, but which cannot be presented as such. Now, this sounds shockingly similar to Deleuze's description of pure difference or difference in itself. Because in Difference and Repetition, Deleuze explicitly has to provide transcendental deductions to justify his argument about the virtual exceeding the actual. He uses transcendental deductions kind of like Kant had done in the Critique of Pure Reason because these are arguments which deduce the form of appearance by asking what the conditions would have to be for something to be given as it is. Deleuze falls back on such transcendental deductions because these allow us to know about the virtual qua the underlying intensities and pure differences without having to meet the impossible demand of allowing us to have an experience of these things if by that you mean having an experience of them like the actual identifiable things, which can only be if this virtual background is presupposed as something like that out of which they emerged. While Deleuze argued that this virtual background of pure differences tells us the best definition of what being qua being is, Derrida, on the other hand, takes the exact opposite path of warning that we actually cannot say that difference is because the word is presupposes some vague notion of presence because, as Heidegger told us, when we talk about being within Western metaphysics, we're really talking about something like the mode of presence within time. Difference, according to Derrida, is, however, more primordial than that kind of presence for all of the reasons mentioned thus far. Well, at this point in the talk, Derrida warns his audience also against the other error of thinking of difference as something like the simple gap of Freudian castration. You might remember that for Freud, the castration fear is a largely unconscious fear that the presence of the phallus could someday be replaced by the mere absence which is discovered when the child learns of sexual difference for the first time, or the idea that Daddy might have the phallus, but mommy does not, so I could lose it too. Well, that's exactly not what Derrida wants to talk about in the context of difference, because his understanding of difference, and writing for that matter, is that this is something which is neither present nor absent as such. For this reason, Derrida tells us that difference is irreducible to any ontology, any definition of being, in other words, because any philosophical system that tries to use language to formulate an all-encompassing definition of being qua being had to have first emerged from out of the pre-ontological space of writing. This means that there can be no such thing as an origin because an absolute starting point would be proven to be not so absolute after all given this disruption. For this reason, there are no axioms or definitions in the Euclidean sense of the term because there is no beginning for these first principles to begin from. The position of the absolute beginning simply does not exist, in other words. We cannot speak of axioms for the additional reason that the wandering of differential tracing is not any logical movement from an axiom to proof. 
It is instead just plain. Difference is neither word nor concept because even difference itself has two different meanings um, within the Latin etymology it emerged from. When we use this word, we could be talking about deferring with an E, which is the temporization of space. But we could also be talking about differing with an I, which is simply to not be identical. So difference is something which calls into question both the prioritization of space and time, because it's something which makes space like time and makes time like space. Because the sign presents its referent in its absence, it defers presence. And this is what allows us to describe the trace as an effect without any cause. The trace is an element found in the present, but bears the marks of the past and the future. For this reason, the trace is a very strange thing, which is itself not itself, because it is separated even from its own self by an interval or a space, which we now understand to be the becoming space of time and the becoming time of space. Even as early as Husserlian phenomenology, we have known that this sort of differentiation splits up the present moment because in Husserl's phenomenology of internal time consciousness, we find that we can only experience the smooth flow of time in something like, say, a musical melody. If we don't actually hear one separate moment at a time, but if we instead remain aware of what is just past, while also anticipating what is about to happen. This means that presence is itself always split up, and is split up particularly by the traces of so many retentions and protensions, proving that long before the first Sumerian scribe had written in cuneiform, a certain kind of archie writing, as Derrida calls it, had already been at work in the constitution of something so basic as the passing present moment. This Archie writing is a kind of writing that is like writing, despite the fact that it does not have to be literally inscribed by anyone. But who exactly does this mysterious act of deferring that is required for even the present passing moment to be constituted? Is it the subject and its consciousness that does this actively, in which case the subject would have to exist before or outside the sign which it uses, which leaves us really still within the same standard model of language that we were seeking to call into question. And if that were the case, wouldn't that prove that such a subject um, really does uh, exist within the metaphysics of presence because such a subject would have to gather itself up into a presence in order to actively constitute the passing present moment from so many protensions and retensions. In contrast with the differentiation of signs, which would only occur within something like the Saussurian model of a purely abstract long which exists beyond and outside of the subject. Well, by the time you get to Nietzsche and Freud, you realize that even the ego itself is no longer in a state of coherence fitting the metaphysics of presence, because for Nietzsche and Freud, the ego is no longer in a position of certainty even with regard to itself. Well, for Derrida, the reason why this is the case for both Freud and Nietzsche is actually because of difference. If you think about it, the unconscious admittedly does decenter the ego, but the funny thing about the unconscious is that it does so without being able to exist in the present, while also not really being located in any definite moment in the past either. The trauma of the unconscious actually deals with something from the past that never actually happened, because it can't. The death drive is so massively disruptive a force for Freud, because in one sense, it is the return of a traumatic past into the present moment, but in another sense, it isn't really that at all. Instead, the unconscious is split up by a minimal difference, because it differs from its own self in much the same way that in Nietzsche's eternal return. The grand irony is that what returns is, in one sense, the same, but always with a difference. Or rather, what returns is just a sameness as an unfolding of difference, which is not coincidentally why Deleuze also posited the eternal return 
in the future as the third temporal synthesis within difference and repetition, or the synthesis which discloses pure difference as such. In contrast with both the Freudian death drive and Nietzsche's eternal return, Hegel's dialectic, for Derrida anyway, is an outdated model which seeks to have the same gather itself up into itself through nullifying any differences it encounters into some new identity. This model cannot explain the unconscious, because the latter is more like a trace, or something that never was present and never could be, but isn't exactly absent either. This sort of archy writing, once again, escapes the metaphysics of presence, because it erases itself just as much as it presents itself. Differences, then, quite literally older than being itself, which means that we cannot have a proper name for it, because its name is just the impossibility of naming in any traditional sense of the term. So this was a lot of fun. Thank you. I look forward to continuing the discussion of accelerationism and Derrida.